Well, of all the places you could have been, <laughs> you've chosen to be here at Washington Street United Methodist. Now, if you weren't here when I was here, you don't get that. But every Sunday I was here, my knees would shake. And I just wondered who would come today to hear. And so I began to say, of all the places you could have been, you chose to be here. And I'm grateful for it. And this church is grateful for your faithfulness, not only back then, but now and in the future. What in the world happened? You look the same. I mean, you do. And I've changed. When I left here in 2005, I was jogging a lot. I don't jog now. I do walk, but only on good days. And I didn't have white hair. What happened? But you haven't changed a bit. I'd recognize you. You sit in the same place. <laughs> I mean, what happened? I'm, uh, I carry a little extra baggage now than I used to. But you look the same. And I'm so grateful that you're here this morning. And I'm, I feel privileged to have been asked to preach by your pastor, the Reverend Becky Shirley. Let me tell you something. Methodist preachers are real picky. But I'd love to have Becky as my pastor. And you are blessed to have her. And I count her as a dear, dear friend. I wish Betsy could be here. She loved this church. When we were walking down the hall this morning, I said, Becky, oh, you put Betsy's picture back up that she drew of the church and she painted of the church. And she said, no, Mike, it's been up there. <laughs> but Betsy's um, struggling with some breast cancer now, stage two. And she's very positive, but this weekend, after her first treatment, she was uh, knocked off of her heels. So she's at home. I appreciate the fact that you have heard that Becky has already put her on the prayer list, and I know that you'll continue to do that. I'm thankful that some of my family's here. They've not heard this sermon before, and neither have you. I'm just telling you that, okay? <laughs> You know, I know the jokes about going into uh, the file and pulling out an old sermon, but uh, I didn't do that. I loved this church, this great historic downtown church. I absolutely loved it. Now, I quit some, but I always came back the next day. You got it, you understand. Some of you got it. You know that. But I love this church. It's always been on the cutting edge where God's people ought to be. And I'm grateful for those of you who give leadership here and for those of you who are faithful. And I cherish this time together this morning. From the Old Testament, Genesis 18 I want you to listen to this story. One hot summer afternoon, while Abraham was sitting by the entrance to his tent near the sacred trees of Mamre, the Lord appeared to him. Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. He quickly ran to meet them, bowed with his face to the ground and said, Please come to my home where I can serve you. I have some water, I'll have some water brought so you can wash your feet. Then you can rest under a tree. 
let me get you some food to give you strength before you leave. I would be honored to serve you. Thank you very much. They answered, we accept your offer. Abraham went quickly to his tent and said to Sarah, hurry, get a large sack of flour and make some bread. After saying this, he rushed off to his herd of cattle and picked out one of his best calves, which his servant quickly prepared. He then served his guests some yogurt and milk together with the meat. While they were eating, he stood near them under the tree, and they asked, Where's your wife, Sarah? She is right there in the tent, Abraham answered. One of the guests was the Lord, and he said, I'll come back about this time next year, and when I do, Sarah will already have a son. Sarah was behind Abraham in the tent, listening. Abraham and Sarah were very old, and Sarah was well past the age of having children. So when Sarah heard all this, she laughed and laughed and laughed and said to herself, Now that I'm worn out and my husband is old, will I really know such happiness? The Lord asked Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh? Does, he, does she doubt that she can have a child in her old age? I am the Lord, and there is nothing too difficult for me. This is the word of God for the people of God, and we say, thanks be to God. This morning, I want to explore two biblical narratives which have something to do with the announcement of unexpected births. In each case, The husband and wife are well up in years. And yet the Lord tells them that each will have a son. You know both stories. One is found in Luke, the first chapter. We are informed of how an old priest by the name of Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth are to become parents to the fellow we know as John the Baptist. One day in the temple, Zechariah, while performing his priestly duties, was visited by an angel. And the angel blurts out, you're going to become a father. And the news takes the old man by surprise and almost causes a coronary. He just can't believe it. And because Zechariah did not believe the angel, he was struck mute, unable to speak until the child was born. Now, this shouldn't surprise you. What if you found out at the beginning of your golden years that you were going to have a baby, I bet you wouldn't be able to speak either. The scriptures tell us that Elizabeth is so embarrassed at wearing maternity tops that she doesn't leave home for five months. Her pregnancy must have given the local ladies in the bridge and gossip club plenty to talk about. Those nine months of waiting for the birth of John the Baptist must have been extremely difficult for Elizabeth and Zechariah. Now, in the book of Genesis, chapter 18, you heard the story about Sarah and Abraham. An unexpected announcement about an unexpected birth to an elderly couple. But in this case, they handled the news differently. 
Abraham and his wife, Sarah, were visited by three angels. One of them happened to be the Lord. And one of them, the Lord announced to Abraham that his wife, Sarah, was going to become pregnant and deliver a son. And Sarah, inside the tent preparing hospitality, which Middle Eastern people do, she overheard the conversation. And the Bible tells us that she laughed and she laughed and she laughed at the news of having a baby at her age. Two birth announcements, two very different reactions. Zachariah struck speechless, Sarah laughs. Neither reaction changed the outcome. In both cases, sons were born nine months later. But I do believe that there was a marked difference in the ways Elizabeth and Sarah experienced their pregnancies. I don't have any proof of this. The Bible is really not clear. My conclusion comes from my own experience in life and a firmly held conviction that people in biblical times experience life much as we do, just the same way. I believe it was easier on Sarah because she took advantage of one of God's greatest gifts, laughter. She applied laughter as an active ingredient to make things move more smoothly in her life. We humans often find ourselves in challenging situations. Sometimes we find ourselves in painful, difficult, squeaky tight situations. And we need to remember that laughter is the God-given oil, the lubricant, which reduces the friction and helps us get through some tough times. Laughter is a marvelous gift of God. It's a gift that we Christians should nurture and frequently use. Consider how laughter can teach us. We all must learn that it is evil to manipulate people. We really should be straightforward and honest in all of our dealings with one another. People are valuable and not toys for personal pleasure. So keep in mind that when we use people rather than value them, we usually pay a price. Let me cast this lesson in the form of a story from some years back when you could buy boxes of candy a lot cheaper than you can now. A young 16-year-old boy moved into a new town. He went into the local pharmacy, and he asked the pharmacist for three boxes of candy. I want a $2 box, a $4 box, and a $6 box. The druggist commented that that was such a curious purchase, but he would show the young boy the boxes of candy. The young man responded, Oh, I've got my first date tonight with a girl. And I plan to take her to the movies. On the way to the movies, if she lets me hold her hand, I'm going to give her the $2 box of candy. And while we're at the movie, if she lets me put my arm around her, I'm going to give her the $4 box of candy. And after the movies, if she wants to do some serious hugging and kissing, I'm going to give her the $6 box of candy. Well, the pharmacist laughed, sold the boy the boxes of candy, and the boy went on his way. That night, 
The young man approached the house where the girl lived. The door opened. The girl's father invites the boy in and says, we're about to sit down and have dinner. Why don't you join us? There was plenty of time to do that. The movie was a late movie. And so Jimmy sat down. And the father says, well, will you say the blessing? And when Jimmy sits down at the table, Jimmy responds with these words. He asks God to bless the food and the family. He then asks God for a better world in which everyone treats everyone with decency and respect. After dinner, the boy and girl were on their way to the movies, and the girl said, Jimmy, that was a beautiful, beautiful blessing. I didn't know you were so religious. To which the rather embarrassed Jimmy responds, and I didn't realize your father was the town's pharmacist. <laughs> the lesson to be learned is that it's wrong to manipulate people. We should always be honest and straightforward, and we should value one another. And when we don't, it usually catches up with us. Of course, laughter can be abusive. If you laugh in order to hurt people or as a way to avoid facing the issue, you abuse the gift of laughter. And we, as God's people, must never lose sight of laughter as a marvelous gift from God which strengthens us and eases us through some very tough, difficult times. For centuries, people have recognized that laughter is a good thing. Aristotle called it bodily exercise precious to health. Carl Sandburg said laughter is medicine for the soul. And in his book, Anatomy of an Illness, Norman Cousins writes that he was able to move through a very painful time in his life when his health was poor by reading joke books and watching funny movies. Laughter's good for you. And oftentimes, laughter improves health and makes it possible to get through some tough times. But I'm well aware that there's a darker side of humanity that just hates laughter. I've met a number of people over the years who think laughter is sinful. I've met church people who think laughter is frivolous. I contend that laughter is a gift from Jesus. Jesus, like Sarah, knew that laughter can get us through tough times. Jesus used humor to make a point or to lessen tension. Jesus talked about a camel passing through the eye of a needle or taking the log out of your eye. And when people heard that, they must have laughed. What is he talking about? Laughter, properly applied, is the God-given lubricant to help us through tough times. And I just think in this kind of crazy world in which we live, we as God's people ought to laugh more. In that creed we recited this morning, God is the one who's in charge. Sit back, laugh, God's going to work this out. I've been preaching every summer for the last 10 years at the Pauley's Island Chapel. And back in May, I officiated a wedding there late one Saturday afternoon. After people left and went to the reception, and before I got to the reception, I was getting my robe and getting my paperwork together. And I walked down to the left and looked at a picture that I look at every time I'm in that chapel. It's a picture of a smiling Jesus. 
Nobody else was around. And I just found myself staring at that picture. And I could have sworn I heard Jesus laughing. And with nobody else around, I found myself laughing out loud. I kid you not, with nobody else around, I started laughing. And I'm telling you, every now and then, we all ought to laugh out loud. Some of what I'm saying this morning just runs against the populist wisdom of the day. We have become so confrontational in our society. And the truth is, we are an angry people. We are people who wake up in the morning just determined to tell it like it is. To share our feelings. And I think there is something downright demonic in thinking that we always have to confront every problem. To discuss every difference of opinion. To communicate to others every single negative emotion which flitters through the mind. God did not give us life as a problem to solve. Living is intended to be a joy to experience. I can't believe. I was 45 years old when I came to this church. I'm 71 now. And through the years, I've dealt with a lot of couples in troubled marriages. And many of them spent an enormous amount of time and energy trying to solve problems and not nearly enough time and energy finding a few moments every day to laugh together. Maybe marriages are troubled because there are so many problems. And maybe people in trouble marriages don't laugh because there's nothing humorous in their relationship. On the other hand, maybe couples who make a point of laughing together have as many problems, but they don't notice them as much. Maybe, just maybe, their laughter energizes them through their hurts. Now I realize there are some things in life that are not funny. Maybe your hurt this morning is so intense and so real that you don't feel like you have a thing to laugh about today. But I'm telling you, you need to laugh. To laugh when nothing seems particularly funny does not mean you are unrealistic. Finding something a bit humorous, even in the midst of a troubled time, doesn't mean you are avoiding the issue. Neither Sarah and Abraham nor Elizabeth and Zachariah were planning to have children when it was announced to them. After the golden year's anniversary, we just don't plan on that kind of thing. We don't plan for unwanted surprises, and yet unwanted surprises come to all of us, as do some tough times. Tough times come to all of us, no matter who we are. And the choice is not whether or not tough times come, because they will come. The choice we have is what in the world are we going to do when the tough times arrive. Maybe we'll laugh. Zechariah met his situation with all seriousness and he was struck speechless. His take it all so seriously attitude didn't change the end result. His wife delivered a nine pound bouncing baby boy and they named him John. But between the announcement and delivery, I think 
Zechariah must have been miserable. Sarah, on the other hand, greeted her news with a bit of lighthearted laughter. Her laughter didn't change the end result. Isaac was born. But the difference was how she experienced that wait. And I think Sarah found a time of waiting much easier than Zechariah. And it was easier because she laughed. One of the things I used to say to you was, Betsy's away this morning, so I'm going to talk about her. <laughs> Betsy's away this morning, so I'm going to talk about her. Some years ago, Betsy drove me crazy. Because at the end of the day, she would say to me, Mike, what made you laugh today? And that irritated me because I didn't have a lot of laughter in my life at that time when she started asking the question. I was feeling tremendous stress. And I just said, nothing, Betsy. And she said, that's a shame. You ought to find something to laugh about. Looking back on that now, I re realize how important that question was then and how important it is now. But I want you to take this with you as you leave. I want you to go home tonight or this week, or in the near future, and I want you to ask yourself, what made me laugh today? And I want you to do better than what I did. This is a crazy world in which we live. But we are faithful to a God who's going to have the last word with all of us. And we don't have to work everything out. God's going to work things out. So we need to laugh, and we need to laugh, and we need to laugh because it's the oil for squeaky, tough times. It's a wonderful gift of a loving God. And I'm absolutely convinced that if you laugh more in the days ahead, your soul is going to be better. And you might just hear Jesus laughing back with you as we face the days ahead.